The first paper in this session is entitled Recalibration of the Path Integration System in an Augmented Reality Environment. Our speaker is James Kinnearum of Johns Hopkins. Jim, it's a pleasure. Welcome. Uh, so there'll be very little technology in this talk. It'll be mostly science. <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll tell you what MEMS stands for a little bit into my talk as far as I'm concerned, but not what you think it is. <laughs> okay, so today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, this part of the brain called the hippocampus, uh, which is, uh, we know it's involved in, in learning and memory in humans. Most people have heard about this, uh, the famous patient HM, who's an amnesic patient who lost his hippocampus through an experimental surgery and lost the ability to form new memories. And also, if you've uh, followed some Nobel Prize winning research in the past few years, uh, John O'Keefe, uh, uh, Mybert Moser, and Edward Moser won a Nobel Prize in 2014 for their discovery of what's called place cells and grid cells in this part of the brain. So the, these are cells that are spatially selective when an animal walks around in an environment. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. But the question you might have is, what do these place cells that animals have, what when we, humans also as good evidence have, uh, to get us to, around to navigate in an environment, what's that got to do with things like declarative memory or episodic memory? And actually, John O'Keefe and Lynn Adell proposed uh, this idea back in 1978 about the relationship between uh, spatial mapping and memory. They propose that the hippocampus is the core of a neural memory system, providing an objective spatial framework within which the items and events of an organism's experience are located and interrelated. The idea of their uh, cognitive map theory is that the hippocampus creates, pr provides a spatial, and now we know a spatial temporal framework, a context that all the events that occur during experience come into the hippocampus, get laid down on top of this spatial and temporal framework, bound together in such a way that they can be stored and then later on retrieved and, and, and re, uh, uh, reminisced or recollected as a conscious memory of that experience. So that's the basic idea uh, between uh, work in my lab, trying to understand that all sounds nice. And actually, this is becoming more or less, I think, a consensus viewpoint of most of the people uh, in, in our field. Uh, but that's still really, you know, words. You know, can we put some uh, meat on those bones here? And we use an, 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 an a sort of combination anatomical approach as well as uh, computational. I'm not an anatomist or a computational neuroscience, but reading that literature to come with ideas of how this system might work. And this is a very complicated diagram of hippocampal circuitry, but just to uh, uh, break it down a little bit, we know that there are two overlapping but segregated input streams into the hippocampus. One that goes through the medial and toronto cortex. This is where the Moser lab discovered grid cells. Uh, another coming through the lateral and toronto cortex. Uh, where there aren't any grid cells, there is some spatial tuning, but not nearly as selective. And we kind of, th we, we think that the, right now, at least one way of thinking about it is that, in talking about that initial quote from O'Keefe and Nadell, that the, this is the pathway that brings in the spatial temporal framework, and this might be the pathway that brings in input about the items and events of experience. In other words, the contents of an experience and the spatial temporal context of the experience, which then gets brought into the hippocampus through some uh, memory dynamics between the dentate gyrus CA3 region and then output through the CA1 region. So this is about just a, a big wiring diagram of different components of how we, this system might work. But the talk today, I'm gonna be talking about only this region here, this green, uh, red region here, talking about the spatial temporal framework and especially the role of path integration uh, in the uh, development and the, 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 uh, uh, how this part of the brain creates a cognitive map. Uh, through this pathway, but we're going to be recording cells in the CA1 region, the output of the hippocampus. So what is a place cell? Just for people who don't know, uh, these were the cells that were discovered by John O'Keefe and Jonathan Dostrovsky in 1971. Uh, this is date, data from my lab, but it's a, a bit what basically shown what they showed many years ago. If an animal is walking around in environments, just like a square chamber like this with a single white cue card, you record from CA1 cells of the hippocampus, as well as other cells in other regions of the hippocampus, you find that they fire when the animal occupies specific locations. So here's an example of 10 different cells. This blue diagram here is just a, a representation of the floor of the box. Blue indicates regions where the cell is silent, and the color code shows regions where the cell is highly active. 
So as the animal runs around the box, just looking for pieces of chocolate sprinkles we, we throw around there, this cell is silent when the animal's here, but then brrrr, fires when he runs that way, is silent, and brrr, brrr, fires that way. So at this location in the chamber, this cell is selectively active. Another cell fires in the same location, but here's a cell that fires when the rat's at this location where you see here against the cue card. Uh, this cell fires along this wall, this cell fires in the center. You record enough of these cells and each, the whole environment is mapped out by the firing of these spatial cells. And you can actually, with high accuracy, decode the animal's position uh, just by uh, recording the population of a number of these cells. So it was the discovery of these cells that made O'Keefe uh, come up with the idea that, that this, uh, the hippocampus might be the locus of what uh, um, had been called by, by Edward Tolman many years ago, this idea about a, a, co a cognitive map that we have inside of our heads. So how do these cells get their firing properties? Well, uh, we know they're controlled in, in a large extent by external landmarks, but every so often you do an experiment and something weird happens where, and here's one example of an of of of, uh, experiment that we did years ago where here's again a, eight different cells here when I'm looking at the firing of the cells, and these don't look very spatial, do they? They're firing all over the place. They don't seem to have the kind of specific firing locations that I showed you before. But when we looked at the firing in three minute intervals, what you see what's really going on is that this cell had a place field here, and the field rotated to a new location, rotated here and here. And if you look at all the different firing rate maps, what you see is that it actually is, a, within each of these one th segments here, the cells have a nice place field, but the whole map has just been drifting around. It's rotating. This is an animal who had been disoriented and had just lost its bearing relative to any landmarks out there, and it was no longer controlled by landmarks. But what you see is that all the cells fire, they maintain their relationships to each other, and the whole map just starts to rotate around, completely decoupled from any cue out there. So there must be something in the system that allows each cell to know where to fire relative to its neighboring cells. And the idea is that this is the animal's movement through the environment. Its self-motion is the, is the information it uses to actually keep track of where it is and keep one cell firing uh, uh, after the other. So a common view of path integration, if you read the literature, is the following, that if the animal starts at a, a location here, it can keep track of its movement vector, a, a, a distance traveled or a speed traveled in a certain direction, and it integrates that vector over time and keeps track of where it is as if a, 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 it's keeping track of, of a vector from where it currently is from its starting point and adds that vector over and over such that when it wants to return back to its starting location, it kept track of that vector in its mind and can make a direct uh, line back. Often this is how path integration is studied in the behavioral literature. It's, this is called a behavior called homing. Keep track of where your starting point was and then go back home when you want to. I just want to make the point here though is that homing and path integration are not the same thing. Uh, you can keep track of position by integrating your movement over time represented by a homing vector. So if this is an animal making this trajectory through a world with different landmarks in it. You can, it, it can be the case that it's keeping track of its starting point at each location uh, and just saying, okay, this is where I am relative to my starting point. But you could also keep track of position by using path integration to update a, a, a landmark vector. So if you know you start here relative, say, to this landmark, you can keep track of where you are always relative to that landmark. Or you can keep track of where you are as a coordinate on a map. And this is the way we're going to be talking about it in this talk here. The idea is that in the hippocampus, both grid cells and place cells, this is a map-like representation and you're keeping track of your location by integrating your movement by keep up updating these coordinates on, on a map like this. It's just like centuries ago when navigators were sailing the seas without any GPS. How did they do it, right? Well, the, the, the pilot had a, had a chart, uh, had, a, had a, a compass that let them know what direction they're, they're, they're going, and every half an hour or so they would take a, a measurement of speed and decide, okay, well, if we, if, if we started out here and we moved in this direction by this speed, by this certain time, we must have traveled that distance and we're here now. And they would just keep ma mapping, uh, uh, charting on their maps here where they think they are uh, until then they came across maybe a, a, an island that's on their chart and they say, okay, we're a little bit off, we're going to correct our error and then move uh, across the sea that way. The idea is this, this dead reckoning at sea is exactly what we think is going on inside uh, uh, the head in terms of the, the maps. <coughs> 
And we think that the medial interferon cortex, that the, 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 the part of that red part of my anatomical diagram, uh, is thought by, uh, in, in many models, to compute path integration. It's got the compass there. These are called head direction cells. I won't go into them, but these are cells we think provides information about the, the heading direction of the animal or something close to that. There are speed cells in the entorinal cortex uh, that encode uh, the speed the animal runs uh, through the environment. Uh, there are these grid cells I mentioned, cells that fire in these hexagonal arrangement of, of firing. Unlike a place cell, it fires in one place. These grid cells famously record, fire in many locations at this exquisite triangular or hexagonal arrangement. And boundary cells that seem to be involved in, uh, in, in encoding the boundaries of an environment. And, with all these other signals in the system, uh, it all has all the signatures that not only were led to this idea by Bruce McNaughton, by the Mosers, by a number of people about how path integration may be computed in this system here, but then also other cell types that had not been discovered at the time but were predicted and turned out to be true. So there's lots of evidence to suggest that indeed this pathway is involved to a large extent in this path integration uh, computation. So that brings us up now to, to the topic of, of our talk. Uh, in terms of what we're going, we're going to be looking at, what we're calling the path integr integration gain. And the idea is the following, that if this is an animal, running, a rat running from one uh, location to the next, uh, in time t and t plus one is here, uh, there's a, a, a distance that the rat has traveled. And what the brain has to do is in its cognitive map, it has to actually update its representation by the same amount. So you can consider this, the, 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 the distance traveled in direction by, in the brain has to equal uh, the distance direction traveled in the rat in, in the real world by the certain gain factor, G. And that gain factor has to roughly equal one or be close to one. You know, you want to update the representation in your head of where you think you are as you move around the world by the same amount you really are moving around the world. If this G is also by 0.5 and I, I move across the stage half the way, but my, I'm only updating on half the, in my head that I've, I've gone half that distance and I move around, I'm very quickly going to become disoriented in where I think I am in the world compared to where I actually am moving around. So the idea is that this, uh, uh, that's what we call this gain factor, the relationship between actual movement through the world versus, through the world versus movement updating in, in, in the cognitive map in the head. And the, the, the analogy is to the vestibular ocular reflex. So people, I'm not sure how many people, non-neuroscientists, but this is a very famous thing that you study in all neuroscience uh, courses, uh, as you, this famous re reflex, we all study that as you move your head back and forth, in order to maintain a, a stable gaze, uh, there's a reflex that takes vestibular information that detects my head movement, and then adjusts my eyes by, by, by uh, changing my eye muscles in a way to keep my eyes rotating exactly the opposite direction. And that's something that, uh, so in this case here, G has to equal one. The eye movements have to equal the head rotation to keep the eye stable as you move around the world, have a, a stable image. But we know that that's a plastic response. So I take my glasses off. Well, now you're all zipping back and forth over my, over my eyes here because the optics have changed now and my muscles and my eyes are no longer rotating, my, uh, rotating the eyes the same way to keep the image stable. That shift of the image is called the retinal slip and that's an error signal, but if I walked around for a couple of hours without my glasses on, that reflex would change, that gain would change, and it would it, it, such that it would actually rotate my eyes appropriately to match the rotation of my head, and I can now walk around the world with, without it jumping around so forth. So that's called plasticity in the vestibular ocular reflex. It's known to be controlled uh, by plasticity in the cerebellum. So we suggest that that same gain factor in the path integration system, in this, really, in this cognitive system, has to have the same kind of plasticity as it does in things like the motor system. Uh, the idea, why do you have a VOR? Well, it's not because of eyeglasses. We do not evolve to wear eyeglasses. But it is true that as we go older and move around, our eye muscles change. And a lot of other things change in our vestibular system that uh, we, we need to constantly adjust the synapses and so forth to, to account for changes in, 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 in the, 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 the hardware of the system. And that's true throughout the whole motor system. So now in this cognitive system, we make the same argument that as I move around the world using self-motion information, uh, motor efference copy, vestibular input, and if you're an ant counting steps in the desert, these are all inputs that have to go into the system, and they will change over time. And you need to have a system that will adapt that gain to change into the inputs. So we wanted to test whether or not uh, this was indeed a similarly plastic uh, system. So to test the hypothesis, we built 
what we call the dome. Now, this has nothing to do with the dome we just heard about in terms of Australia and the, uh, uh, the, the brain and the, uh, uh, initiatives at Cavalier. But this is a, what we call the dome here by two students, uh, 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 Ravi Jayakumar and a postdoc, uh, Manu Madhav, uh, working in a collaboration with Noah Cowan in the mechanical engineering department at, at Hopkins. Uh, we, we designed this apparatus as a rat could be running around on a tabletop here, and he's tethered by a boom arm here. And you're gonna, what we're going to see is the rat's just going to be running around the apparatus here. Now, what we, when we run the experiments, right now this dome apparatus is, is, is raised up, so we, we, we close this down. So the rat is now uh, in, in, in the middle of this seven-foot planetarium-style dome where we can control landmarks. And what's going to happen is there's a, uh, a projector here which is going to come down off of a silver mirror here and project landmarks onto the interior surface of this dome. And we're going to keep track of the rat's movement as it moves around in a circle here. And as it does that, we're going to use that in a feedback loop to actually change the landmark array that, runs, that, that moves around the rat as a function of the rat's movement to the world. So here's an example, uh, a picture of what the landmarks look like. This is just a crummy, you know, landscape mode uh, uh, iPhone where we just looked at uh, uh, all, all the uh, uh, landmarks and, and they're somewhat distorted, but you can just get a feeling for what the landmarks look like and there's a ring of light uh, on the top of the dome that will always be on even when we turn landmarks off in the further experiment. Uh, uh, but so the route will always be under illuminated conditions. Okay, so here are the manipulations we're going to do. So one example we could, we could do, uh, we could change the gain of the landmarks, so the function of how the landmarks move as a function of the rat's movement. Uh, a gain of less than one means that the landmarks are going to move uh, in the same direction of the animal. A gain of greater than one means it's going to move in the opposite direction. So here you can see as the rat moves slowly, the landmarks are moving slowly, and as the rat picks up speed, they pick up speed. Here's a situation where now the landmarks move in the same direction as the animal, uh, and you can see that uh, it's taking the rat actually more than a single lap to actually catch up to a landmark. Here, the landmarks move in the opposite direction, so the landmarks are catching up to the rat even before it completes a full lap. So in this case here, perceptually, it's as if the animal is moving slower than it really is, and this we get the illusion the rat is really running faster than it really is. And we can do this to kind of extreme cases here. When we make a landmark gain of zero, this is a situation where the landmarks move exactly with the rat. So when the rat stops moving, the landmarks stop moving. When the rat stops moving faster, the landmarks move faster with it. It's like it's on a treadmill running in place. It's not getting anywhere, although it actually physically is moving around. So this is different from standard virtual reality systems where animals are on a treadmill or a track mill moving around, the world moves around them. We actually have an animal really moving through the world, so having all the same motor system uh, inputs, all the same vestibular inputs as during natural movement, but we're also changing the world, the relationship of the movement and the relationship to the landmarks. Here's a situation where uh, a very high gain, uh, greater than one, as the animal runs around, you can see these landmarks are moving very quickly. So here the rat meets that landmark, reaches it again, and then again, and so forth. So the rat is in each lap around the track, the rat is actually encountering the same visual information many times. So uh, what happens under these conditions? So here's, an, here's what we're showing uh, uh, some, what place cells look like in this situation. In this representation, uh, we show time is on this axis here, and each uh, different gray, white and gray uh, bar corresponds to a single lap of the rat, in this case in the track uh, angle. So the first seven or eight laps, we have the landmark stationary, and we can see three cells that are showing normal place cell activity. So the rat runs around from the track in this direction, it completes one lap, First this cell fires, then and this cell fires, and then the third cell fires. And you can see that each lap, the cell is firing the exact same location represented by angle on the track here and here. So it's just a very nice standard, stable place field map. And then we start to change the gain of the uh, landmark array. And we st steadily ramp it up. Uh, the landmarks start moving, fa uh, uh, in this case, to a, a gain of, uh, of up to one that goes higher and higher and higher and higher, okay? And what you start seeing is in the landmark, uh, in, in the angles relative to the track or the room coordinates, the place fields start to drift around a lot. And what's happening is the, uh, the place field map is being controlled by the landmark array. And we can show that by replotting these dots, the same dots, but now we replot them in landmark space. This is the angle of the animal relative to the rotating landmark array. And what you can see is that the place cells that are stable here remain stabil uh, stable in this framework. So what's happening, even as we bring this up to a very uh, high uh, uh, 
a high amount of, of rotation of landmarks, uh, the cells, the play cells are being controlled very strongly by that uh, 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 ro rotation angle. So this is a situation where the landmarks are moving in the same direction of the animal. So as it's approaching one here, that means it's approaching the, the, the fact where the, the rat's running, 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 but it's, it just can't get past that landmark and so forth. So what's very really interesting is that in this, when, when, in, in this framework here, the places look normal, but notice what, what's going on here. Uh, by the time the animal is at this really uh, high gain here, uh, the cell is firing over the same amount of angles in landmark space, but if you look at the points here, you can see that actually uh, it takes about three laps of the rat running around in real physical reality uh, to, for that cell to keep firing until finally that cell shuts off. So a, a cell that would normally fire on maybe 90 degrees of the track is now firing over three full laps of activity before it shuts off. And we've got a video here which will uh, uh, show that. What I'm going to show you here is some overhead view. So on the top here, uh, just we'll, we'll stop this for a second to orient. This is just an overhead view of the rats running around. And this is in the uh, frame of a uh, field of view of the room. And this is the landmark uh, <coughs> frame of reference. So we just take all the video frames and we've rotated the video frames to match the rotation of the angles. And now what we're showing here at the, the, the uh, dash line here is where we are in the session. And you can, what we're going to see down here is that in this frame, landmark room frame, uh, in the landmark frame, you'll see the cells continuously active, uh, whereas over, uh, as the rat's probably moving, whereas here you're going to see as the rat runs a number of laps, the cell is, uh, keeps firing. So here you can see the rats, you know, he's trying to get somewhere, but he's, he's really not moving anywhere in landmark space, and the, and the cell continue, is, is just firing over the normal stretch of time. Whereas here in the, cor correct, in the frame of reference of the room itself, uh, you can see that the cell is just firing almost continuously as the rat uh, runs around. So what we've shown is that these landmarks are just completely controlling uh, the activity of the cells. And if, if I had shown you an example of the uh, rotations the opposite direction, what you would see is something similar, that the cells would look normal plotted against the landmarks. But if, this was, if, their, if their landmarks were rotating the opposite direction, what you would see is, like, for example, the cell might fire twice per lap. Okay, so he's harnessed. He's harnessed. Uh, yes, his body is harnessed, yes. Okay, so now that was all to show that, yes, uh, we can control the place fields by our landmark manipulations, by our game. Uh, we've, the illusion, we, we, we've, we're fooling the rats, so to speak, that it, it, to being, it, 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 to, we're overriding its own path integration system where it was around by these landmarks. So now the question is, what happens now after we give the rat a number of trials and then turn the landmarks off? So here's a situation where uh, we have a gain of one. Here's normal place field. We start to ramp the gain. Now this is, uh, the line's going up here, but this is actually an experiment where they're actually the, the, the gain's in the opposite direction, where we're actually running, uh, the, the, the landmarks moving opposite the direction of the rat. And you can see in the track framework, the cells are drifting all over the place. But once again, when we pull out the place fields relative to the landmarks, it's a nice stable representation. So we're showing the cells are being controlled very strongly by the landmarks. In this case, the landmarks moving in the opposite direction of the animal, making it think it's going really, really fast. And then we, we run about 30 laps under those conditions. And then we turn the landmarks off, and what happens? If this gain factor I'm talking about in terms of the path integration gain was a fixed variable, well, then when we turn the landmarks off, it should just revert back to path integration. The rat has a whole lifetime of saying that G is 1, OK? As I move through the world, my map updates in the world. And if that were the case, then we should start seeing uh, these place fields being stable again in this framework, because there's no more landmarks to override it. But if this period of time here has recalibrated that system, the system is now learning a new relationship of how, how it moves its legs to how its, its map is updated, we should actually see that the system is more, is still stable in this landmark array, as if the landmarks are still on. And more or less, that's what happens. Uh, it's not completely stable, but you start to see drift in the absence of landmarks, but we know that happens even normally. Without landmarks, the path integration system does accumulate error and drift, and we're seeing that drift. 
but clearly it's a much more stable relationship here than up here. So we're seeing actually we have indeed recalibrated this gain factor of the, uh, of the system. So uh, just a quick, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll just do a quick piece of the video and then wrap up. So once again, we see here the overhead view. Now here's the animal uh, in landmark space. You can see a cell. This is just before we turn the, lam this, the, the landmarks off. This orange yellow cell here is firing twice per lap. It looks like it's normal in the landmark frame. Now here we're going to turn off the landmarks. And what you're going to see is that the cell is continuing to fire more or less two times per lap. Uh, whereas before the training, it was firing just like a normal play cell. So here it fires here. It's firing again. He's stopping grooming, eating. Now it moves again. It's firing here and here. So now the cell continues to fire more than once per lap, which is not the normal situation, because of this time that we've trained the animal. Uh, to show this, here's an example of one animal where we, the different experiments we did. Uh, we're just showing here, we, all the times we change the gain uh, to make the rat seem like it's going slower or faster, uh, and we actually measure what we call the hippocampal gain. It just shows, I won't go into details, it just shows whether or not the, the cells are, are, are following suit with the landmarks. And in each case here, uh, indeed, the place cells follow the gain of the landmarks. We turn the landmarks off, and you can see it was never perfect recalibration, but the system would always uh, settle back on a gain that was not one, which we would expect if there was no plasticity. It would always settle at some gain in the right direction, either positive or negative, uh, and would maintain that gain actually for quite a while, 30, 40, 50 laps. And this is just showing all the rats that we did, five different animals, each color is different animals, the different kinds of gains make the rat seem slower or faster, and we have this very nice linear relationship where every single time we would be able to recalibrate this system. So uh, to summarize, uh, just what we said earlier, this path integration being a memory, a computation of behavior, uh, lots of evidence indeed of path integration models of place cells and grid cells uh, being uh, uh, supported. And here I think we're, we're showing in this highly cognitive system, this the plastic gain uh, of the system, very similar to what you see in many low times in, in things like the motor system, but now in terms of this high order cognitive map system, uh, we also have this uh, uh, re gain recalibration. So just uh, uh, Francesco Zavelli was one of the uh, uh, scientists in the lab who's been highly involved in this. I mentioned Manu and Ravi. This is work in collaboration with uh, Tad Blair and uh, Noah Cowan, whose group uh, built the dome and has been involved in all of our analyses. So thank you.